kind of the, some of the, the highlights and as you are all um, learning about the vacation rental industry, these are some of the hot buttons that your clients will want to know about and some of the buzzwords that you want to talk about. But one of the things we, we cover is the cap rates. Um, they have very, very high cap rates. We've learned that the players that are getting into this vacation rental space are those that ordinarily would be in the commercial space. So um, does anyone work in the commercial space now a little bit? Anyone have an idea what commercial is getting cap rate wise? No, but I know it's up right now. Yeah, you're right, right, right. And I, and I mean, uh, what I've heard is in the sixes, like if you're getting sixes, they're doing backflips. It's that great. Um, is Michael Pollock picking up stuff out here? Could be. I'm not familiar with Michael Pollock. He owns half the East Valley. I we I mean I don't I know nothing about Mesa Chandler Tempe. All right, so um, we would never I mean we don't have homes in that area just because that's not one of the big areas. Scottsdale is really in, you know this is what we're talking about Scottsdale is the number one market in the country, right? Because one it has what inexpensive luxury properties. Leanne, what's the two million dollars buy you in Chicago as opposed to two million dollars in Paradise Valley? Right, significantly different, right? Which is one of the main uh, attractions to the city of Scottsdale as a vacation rental. Um, Are you guys already booked up? Sorry. No, no, please, yeah, please, and obviously, please just throw questions as we go. Are you guys already booked up for the spring? Um, no, not for the spring. So typically, the bookings will occur about 90 days prior to the stay. So right now, we are doing a lot of bookings for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for Hanukkah, for New Year's. Um, we're actually getting a lot of the, the trips where the families would be staying in the Bahamas that have just been decimated from the hurricane are now making alternative plans and, and taking bookings here. So bookings will typically occur about 90 days before the stay. Um, one thing that, that I don't think I have in, in these slides here is that the guests who stay in the homes, right? We have our biggest guests, the biggest category of guests are multi-generational families grandma, grandpa, aunts and uncles, and all the kiddos, right? Um, so that's who's staying in these large homes. One of the things that we have learned, and you know, I'm, I sit on the marketing board for the Vacation Rental Managers Association. Um, you know, we kind of have our, we're part of all these big international associations, so we can be on top of the national trends. So obviously we know what's going on here locally, but nationally it's important for us to stay on top of it. Um, and one of the things that, that we've learned is that females are the ones that do the bookings. So as we run our Facebook ads, guess what? We only show those to females. So we only run our Facebook ads um, to females only because we know those are the ones that are, uh, that are doing the bookings. We also get obviously the bachelor parties, bachelorette parties. Uh, we try to avoid putting those in our, uh, some of our higher end mansions and we'd rather put them in places like this in the homes where the homeowners are, are okay with that. Um, vacation rentals don't have major wear and tear, significantly less than the traditional long-term tenants, right? And the reason why is every guest that comes in, what happens? Cleaners come in right after them. What also happens? We have our maintenance team does a 75 point inspection. So if there's a mark on the wall, it gets painted. If that air filter needs to be changed every 30 days, it happens. The light bulbs out. If there's a water, we check for water leaks. We make sure that the home's in tip top shape for the next guest. Um, and the other thing, we don't host large events and weddings. This is, you know, the guy who was here earlier who left earmuffs, but he was saying he's hosting an event for 285 people at his Airbnb in New River. And I'm like, holy hell, like that is exactly what the regulators are trying to get out of this industry. They do not want big events. And the catalyst behind the new 2672, SB 2672, which was the law that, uh, I, I always wanna say Justice Kavanaugh, but John Kavanaugh, the Arizona State Senator out of Fountain Hills on his quiet little cul-de-sac Fountain Hills neighborhood has a giant party house three doors down from him. And he's trying to figure out how do we get rid of these people? I don't want that. And so he proposed legislation, 2672 that said, Homes cannot have more than two guests per bedroom plus two, right? So a four bedroom house could have 10 people. Um, but we were very successful. You know, we, we engaged the Goldwater Institute and then we lobbied on behalf. I was down there in the committee meetings to make sure that 
the, the uh, senators and the committee members understood what the professionals are doing to avoid having 288 people at your house, right? So we don't have large neighborhood or large events, and that means we don't disturb the neighborhood. Now, just Parsons Villas, we have private security that drops past on weekends. We install products called Noise Aware, which measures the decibel levels within the home, right? And inside, it doesn't record, it doesn't pick up what we are saying, it just measures decibel levels. So we can put some parameters on there that say, if it's past nine o'clock and the decibel level gets violated for five minutes, notify Parsons Villas. Wow. And then we put. Pro- That, that's right, and so those parameters are only going to kick in typically after 9 p.m. So the noise ordinance is 10 p.m. All of our signage says 9 p.m. because I don't know, like when I'm on vacation, I never listen to those signs either, right? So we're loud. So uh, we sit, we have plastic or uh, clear signs on the doors that say no loud noises after nine. If you're loud after nine, we can kick you out and keep all of your money. We have metal signs that go outside that say the same thing because we have a vested interest in not disturbing the neighborhood, right? We want to be good, good neighbors. So you can, so, they can still have like, pe- like it's still festive, but it just can't be super. Yeah, loud. absolutely. Like it, like that's exactly it. And if the noise gets too loud, what happens? We, we pull up our phone and we look at the front camera because we always have a camera facing the front door. We see nothing going on. We pull up the back camera at the back swimming pool, which we always have a, a camera facing the swimming pool. It's just the guys in the backyard having a cigar. It's the bachelorette party doing whatever, right? We're gonna pick up the phone. Hey guys, you know, looks like you're having a great time over there. You know, just make sure you're you're a little quiet. You know, we, we got the noise aware alert, so please be quiet. Conversely, we pull up that front door camera. We see 85 people walking in. <laughs> hey, Paradise Valley PD, we need to meet you over at our house at 123 Main Street. We're kicking out a bunch of people of our vacation rental. So you have somebody obviously Yep, we have uh, we have people that maintain the phone lines, but that's not somebody internally. We have a third party that, that they kind of roll over, and they have a detailed list of each of our homes that can allow them to troubleshoot the, okay. the areas. Um, so yeah, so we we try to stay pretty much on top of that. So um, is, that, is it Airbnb that actually makes any of those like you can't have weddings, or is that on a local level? So there's no, right now there's no legislation that would prevent it. It is more of a, um, a prudence thing, I would say, on our part, that we're, those aren't the guests that we want. They, there's undue wear and tear on the homes. The weddings, we, we've tried that experiment, and the furniture's all out of place, and they hang stuff up, and they don't put stuff away at the end. And, and so now if they ask us, you know, money talks, right? So we're like, okay, $100 a head, <laughs> right? No way anyone's ever going to do that to put a hundred dollars ahead to host a wedding, um, plus all their food. So, you know, we kind of allow them to weed themselves out. One thing we do, and I think I mentioned this last time, we follow them on Instagram, right? We let them tell on themselves. So it's always good to kind of stay on top of the guests and we screen them. We have a concierge uh, gal, she handles all of our sales and concierge services. So whenever somebody books the, the house or we get an inquiry from one of our, one of our online leads or a past guest, they're gonna pick up the phone and, hey, Mr. Guest, thanks for booking with us today. Uh, looking forward to your trip. What are you coming out here for? Oh, it's a bachelor party? You know what? The, the house you're at is actually like a quiet little sh- street. It's probably not a good fit. We can either cancel and refund it right now or we can move you to another location, whatever is best for you, Mr. Guest. Also, that concierge is gonna offer them the same type of amenities that one could find in the hotel. Do you want the personal chef to be brought in to cook you a dinner? Do you want a masseuse to come in for a couple's massages? Do you want pink Jeep tours set up? Do you need bottle service? Do you want St. Bernard puppies in the backyard when you arrive, right? Like whatever you want, we're gonna do. We, we don't accept pets, but um, you know, whatever, whatever the guest wants. What about little dogs now? Uh, the, the rule is no. The, the general rule is no. Obviously we have to adhere to uh, the Disabilities Act and things like that. We have some homeowners that are like, hey, Tim, we're pet people. As long as it doesn't shed and it's a small dog, you know, we're willing to take 500 bucks to allow them to bring their dog. We try to avoid that because it's it's very difficult from a management standpoint to manage those one-offs, right? It's very easy whenever everything's dressed right dressed. So we try to avoid the one-offs the best that we can. Um, 
What do the numbers say? This is what what is important to Leanne as well as all of you realtors. This is what your clients are going to want to know. What do the numbers say, right? And Jen, this is what we were talking earlier is what, you know, kind of how does that pencil out and where do we look at number wise? So this is what a good deal looks like. Not every deal pencils out this way. This is what a good deal looks like that we would be comfortable going into the deal with, right? And it looks like this. The gross rental revenue should be about 20% of the acquisition price. So a million dollars, $200,000. That's right. You left your shoes on, impressive, to do that math that quickly. <laughs> um, well, uh, so, so that's the gross rental revenue, right? And the homeowner is going to take out about half of that, right? In the next slide, I'll show you what's all included in that half. But just know the net net to the homeowner is about half, okay? So we buy it for a million, we gross two hundred thousand. Net net to the homeowner is about one hundred thousand, okay? Um, the cap rate we talked about it seven percent or higher. We have nothing in our inventory that's less than seven and a half percent. As we said earlier, if you tell somebody in a commercial space 6%, they're happy. So as you're calling up your database saying, hey, Mr. Mr. Friend, Realtor, or Mr. Buddy, have you looked at vacation rentals? Like these numbers are crazy. I thought of you right away. They're getting 7% cap rates. Let's go have a drink and talk about it. This, this is right up your alley. Hey, Mr. Customer, you have 15, $200,000 rentals, short or long-term rentals. Have you ever thought about turning those all in on a 1031 exchange and buying a luxury piece of property and generate way more revenue from a, a total standpoint? We can write off the depreciation, right? Then we can also, um, as you know, luxury tends to, is less volatile in an, in an economy, right? It doesn't go up as much and it doesn't go down as much. Also what happens in a down economy, which at some point is gonna occur, right? This is the longest uh, running bull market in the recorded history. At some point, it's going to slow down. Well, the people who vacation in a $2 million home, this is, these are the homes they live in. The, these people still vacation. So whenever we're kicking out all the tenants in three years because they can't pay their rent in their $150,000 house, well, we could still be generating that revenue in your $2 million Paradise Valley vacation rental. 7%. I, I mean, I have to go like South Phoenix, in some of the neighborhoods I don't like to go to safely. <laughs> right, right. So that's a that's an amazing cap rate. The, it's an amazing cap rate, and the investors they are always looking at it from a worst case scenario standpoint, right? At yeah, least if that's they're good ones. Yeah, right? Two million. I mean, sorry, one million. Mm -hmm. ha, um, the gr the gross the net income is a hundred thousand mm -hmm. on that million dollars. Yep. That's more than seven percent. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So under promise, over deliver, right? Mm -hmm. We have nothing in our inventory less than seven. I think our highest is 10 and a half. And the best part about it is, is anybody familiar with the debt service coverage ratio? I know we're getting pretty technical here. No. The debt service coverage ratio is, is how quickly can and how easily can the cash flow pay for the bills of the property, right? So these numbers are very important to the lenders when they're lending on these properties as vacation rentals. And these are more commercial deals and I know we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but the, the debt service coverage ratios are significantly higher than any of the competitors in this space, which makes the banks a little bit more friendly to, to lend on it. And we have lots of banks that understand this. We've gone through it, we vetted them. So we have a lot of those connections that can say, hey, Jen, we have somebody, we need to buy them in a second home. They understand the vacation rental market. We can get some good rates with them that way. Now, if somebody is buying and they're getting a mortgage and they might want like a pro forma, mm -hmm. the lender's gonna want a pro forma to qualify them, is there like help on your end that would help assist with that? Yeah, so we would. However, the lender's going to take the, for this case, maybe on a refinance, they'll look at it that way. But for the initial purchase, they're gonna take an appraisal for the long-term rental. And that's gonna be the numbers, at least it's been, as it's been explained to me okay. from the underwriters, that they'll look at it from a long-term tenant. Okay. What will a long-term tenant have? And that's what we can use for the, for the ratios. Okay. Um, and then obviously the ROI, and does everybody understand the difference between cap rate and ROI? Right? No. Leanne, do you know the difference between cap rate and ROI? So cap rate is a formula used to compare commercial buildings, apples to apples. And the ratio is 
how much did we acquire the property for divided by how much we make each year? Actually, it's how much did we make each year divided by how much did that asset cost, right? Notice it's not what did we put down. Where ROI is how much money did we have to put out of pocket versus what we make back. So if somebody puts 10% down on that million dollar house, because you can. That's right. That, that's the ROI that's is $100,000 in one year they've made their money back. That's right. Now what does not go into that is the is the principal and interest. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but typical payback plan on these on, on the deal is going to be anywhere from a four to five year up to a 10 year payback period, depending on how that deal is structured. Mm -hmm. But you're right, depending on how, if we get a loan, do we put 10% down? Is it 20% down? Um, is going to change the ROI. We have stuff anywhere from a 15% ROI all the way up into the 40% ROI, right? Those ones are harder to find right now. But the point being is that cap rates are a way for a commercial person to, to compare two separate assets regardless of financing. This is what the building cost me. Forget how I paid for it. This is what it cost. This is what I make off it. That's how, that's what cap rate is. And ROI is just how much did it cost out of pocket, right? So what does that 50% include, right? It includes obviously our 30% marketing fee and management fee. Uh, your, pro your property taxes, a lot of times the homes are purchased in cash. And so we just take the taxes and insurance into our account because those are gonna be due regardless if, there, if there's a note on the property or not. All right? can you see that okay? Okay. Um, and then everything else, the utilities, your premium TV. So we want the number one question guests, guests will ask us is does each TV, does each bedroom have a TV? We're like, well, you know, you're coming to Scottsdale for vacation, right? Are you sure you want a TV in the bedroom? Yes. We want to watch HBO. Okay. Um, so we, we always want the high, high TV, premium TV, high speed internet throughout the house. Uh, we use a product called Orbi that one could get at Costco and it builds a mesh network. So it's the same speed, the same strength, anywhere you go on that property. It's, there's not a different, so it's a little bit different um, than, than our traditional Wi-Fi as we currently use it. Um, that includes your pool service, landscapers. The landscapers come two or three times a month, sometimes weekly. Pool guys come weekly, sometimes semi-weekly, depending on the time of the year. Um, that includes your consumables. They have to buy your soap, shampoo, stuff like that, toilet paper. And then we also do the 70 point inspection. It's actually 75 point inspection after each guest checks out. Um, and then the semi-annual deep clean, right? So we do our deep clean in October and February. After the Phoenix Open, before spring training, and then after the summer months and beginning of October, we do the deep cleans on all the properties to make sure they're in pristine condition whenever the, the peak seasons are coming, right? Um, but again, the 50%, everything except for your debt service payment, which would be just principal and interest only, right? Any questions about either of, of what the uh, numbers say or the 50%? So the fifth, this slide is what you charge to manage the property. So we charge 30%. The other 20%, if you want to think about it that way, is all the other incidentals, the, the landscaping, pool guys, taxes. Okay. Yeah. But you're saying it's basically going to be 40 to 50% is what it's going to cost. Yep. To be able to buy it, say, I don't want to worry about it. Yep. Absentee it's owner. It's not my check coming in. Yep. That's right. So when you're talking to your, to your customers, you're buying it for a million bucks, you're grossing 200, 200,000, your net's a hundred thousand. If you have a loan, you're gonna to have to pay for it out of that hundred thousand. You're doing a lot of your bookings on your website versus Airbnb, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the the Airbnb, those are what's known as OTAs, online travel agents, right? Airbnb, Verbo, HomeAway, um, any anybody that that book that basically finds the guests and books to stay, they don't actually manage the property, right? Um, so we get about, right now we're about 60% come from the different OTAs and we advertise on about 100 different OTAs, right? Um, and then the other 40, 45% come direct bookings, whether that was a repeat guest, whether that was somebody who clicked on one of our thousands of dollars each month that we spend on 
Google pay-per-click ads, Facebook ads, uh, e-blast e campaigns, the same stuff that all you successful realtors are doing with your database, we're doing it with ours as well. And so we get about half come from, or you know, 40% come directly. Now, the reason that's important is, uh, uh, as you're saying here is, we don't have to pay that booking fee to those OTAs, which is gonna be anywhere between one and 10% depending on how much that booking is. And it's almost converse thinking than, than, than what comes natural, but the higher the dollar amount of the booking, the higher the percentage is that they charge, right? The lower the booking, the less they charge. Um, so about half come from those different OTAs, online travel agents. So are, you finding, are, you, are you doing more marketing in specific areas like Chicago, California, Minnesota. Yeah, so I mean, obviously you're hitting on all the same feeder cities that, that come in here and, and the the feeder cities that of those that are moving here in the luxury mm -hmm. market are also the feeder cities from those who vacation here, right? And I think the Travel and Tourism Bureau said on average people that travel here for luxury come at least twice a year, right? So we know they're coming multiple times a year to the city of Scotts. And I don't know if you all know this, but we had a record year last year for Travel and Tourism Bureau, the most hotels. Wow. So the Travel and Tourism is absolutely kicking ass here in the Valley of the Sun, for sure, which is you know one of the reasons why it's so advantageous to own the properties here. I do have a quick question for you, though. So worst case scenario, there is not being rented, right? There, there ends up being a big gap. Are your is your fee based only when it gets rented? Yes, correct. Okay, so there's not going to be any charge to them if there's a really bad month? Um, the ch they're still going to bear the landscaping costs. They're still going to bear the pool costs. They're still going to bear the utility bills, right? Okay. But from a property management standpoint, no, there's nothing that, that we charge. We charge strictly commission based on bookings only. Gotcha. The occupancy rate, do you get into that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, some of the key statistics here, right? The number one thing is the occupancy rate. And so, again, I'll, I'll kind of point out that these numbers that we're talking about, and I'll go back to the slide here, um, about why we're buying these luxury vacation rentals. If we're looking at it as a bell chart, right? On where do we want to buy? The, we're gonna maximize the revenue at the top of that bell chart at the $1 million to $3 million mark, right? There's exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, that's where we have found our best uh, deals is in the $1 million to $3 million space. 90%, um, there's about 9,000, 10,000 homes, not a room in, uh, that somebody's renting out, the entire home that's rented out in Scottsdale and Phoenix, about 10,000. Of those 10,000, less than 10% are six bedrooms plus, right? So basic economics has taught us that is we're finding deals that pencil out the best, they give us the seven plus percent cap rates, are deals where there are large homes with big bed count, right? So uh, we'll go back to these key statistics here. We look at the 55% target, uh, target occupancy rate, right? Um, we're not gonna, we want the 55% because we're not gonna lower our numbers so low in the summer just to keep bodies in the door, right? It doesn't make sense for us to have a $300 a night rental. By the time you, you put AC in it, you pay the, the property management company, you, to have people come through your house to make $200, and the guests that come in the summer is the guests that wanna jam 18 people in a three bedroom house, right? Those are the summer guests, the staycationers. Right, I'm guilty myself, right? I'm not that play. That's my family. Yeah, yeah, right, right, for sure, 100%. Um, those are the staycationers, right? Um, so we shoot for 55% target occupancy rate year round. Obviously, we know that it's gonna be greater in, this, in the, the premium months, um, it'll be lower in the summer. We have, we call micro seasons, right? Where we have price spikes based on an individual season. Might just be a weekend, like we said, the Barrett-Jackson, the two week of Barrett-Jackson, we have a price spike. We don't get as much for that as we do the Arabian Horse Show. The Arabian Horse Show, we get a price spike on. Um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, these are all price spikes. 
price spikes that we have. Um, and then our pricing person will go on and they will review and they'll kind of adjust the pricing accordingly based on what our occupancy rate is, what our neighbors are renting out for. And um, like I said, typically the guests will book about 90 days prior. So we need to be aware, like right now, we're looking at all of our Thanksgiving bookings. Any house that isn't booked up for Thanksgiving right now, we need to be taking a look at and adjusting our rates accordingly. Maybe it's adjusting the photos, maybe it's adjusting the headline, maybe that's adjusting the description, but we're always in there kind of tinkering, if you will, to make sure we have the highest uh, occupancy. Sleep 16 standard. Uh, six bedrooms is a plus. We already talked about less than 10% of all homes are six bedrooms plus. Typically speaking, revenue wise, each bedroom we can add from six up from a six to seven, we generate about 20% rough numbers, about 20% more revenue. From a seven bedroom to eight bedroom, another 20% more revenue. So for each additional bedroom, we generate about 20% more. This is a really interesting statistic. Three guests for each bathroom, right? Um, we know the golden rule about vacation rentals, right? It's about heads and beds. How many heads can we have in the beds? And that's true to a point. The more we can stick to the three guests to each bathroom ratio, the higher we will generate uh, percentage wise of the heads and beds, right? So if we have a six bedroom and it's uh, six get or six bathrooms, we're okay with that. And we're okay adding bunk beds or two sets of queen beds in there. But if it's only two get or two bathrooms, then it doesn't make any sense for us to try and cram more bed for beds into those bedrooms because then it just goes down significantly. Um, so the three to one bath guest to bathroom ratio is very important. The four thousand square feet is important. Um, the, and then these are some of the amenities. These aren't necessarily statistics, but some of the amenities we look for: the heated swimming pool. Uh, is your number one ROI. So the number one thing when you have somebody that buys a house out here needs to have a heated pool, right? Six grand, let's call it. Five grand, six grand to put a heater in retrofit it, depending on if it is a, a propane, if it's natural gas, is it electric, five to six grand. Then the great outdoor area, it's all about the photos. So whenever the people are booking these, that when the guests are booking the homes, they're looking at the photos, so it's important to have the sexy, sexy photos out there, uh, to have the clean line of sight. So, you know, Jen, you were asking earlier, do we help with the construction? No, we don't. We can make recommendations. Or we can. Right, yeah. or, or you can. Yeah, absolutely. I know you have plenty of contacts in that space too, right? Yeah. So, but what we do, uh, we'll advise on is say, okay, we want a putting green over here. Um, you want to have a, a Frisbee golf net over here. And so we will kind of give ideas for what we should have and where. Um, and then the 10 reviews on each platform are, are standard. That The OTAs have kind of taught us and told us that in order to maximize their algorithm, we need 10 reviews on each platform. So one of the things that we do when we onboard a new property is there's a way for us to kind of hyper accelerate the process of getting reviews. And so all of your friends and family that, that um, is willing to help out, we can get them to write reviews on the platform to help us with the algorithm. Uh, and there's just some tricks of the trade that we've learned throughout the years that allow us to, like I said, hyper accelerate that process to get up there. There's fun stuff to do too, like ping pong tables or poker tables. Ping pong tables, pool tables, our, arcade balls. games, cornhole, yeah, um, bocce, um, Put, you know, the, the putting green is absolutely the number two ROI. Oh, so, wow. so, I mean, we, we look at a house and we say, okay, do you have a, a heated pool? No, you need to heat it. Do you have a putting green? No, you need to add one. Okay, you have a volleyball court and a sand volleyball court and a tennis court. Maybe you don't need the tennis or the, the putting green. But the more amenities they have, the better, right? And so, uh, it's all about those little outdoor activities. And again, as the females are doing the bookings, they're envisioning what grandma is gonna feel like sitting outside with little Johnny, her grandson out there on the putting green or out there in the, uh, 
playing foosball or shooting pool, right? They may never use that basketball hoop, but in their mind, they're playing every single night. Um, again, this is just kind of reiterating some of the best practice that we look for. So again, going back with the Realtors, when you have customers that are looking for homes, these are some of the things that we look for. If you want to identify some homes, you can send them over to us. We will build, it's known as a rental performance analysis, an RPA, where we'll send over to you what we realistically think that home can generate revenue. Um, if, it's on, if the home is on the MLS, we can get a good feel for it. If it's not on the MLS, but we have the bedroom and bathroom count, we can still take a analytical approach and we are, whenever we present the numbers, we just make the assumption that the home is awesome inside and they're gonna listen to what we tell them to do. And so we're gonna make those assumptions and give the RPA based on those assumptions. If the house is different inside and it's really run down, needs a lot of work, obviously, you know, probably not a great fit for Parsons, but probably, you know, until you can do the work to it. So that'll give you a realistic best case scenario for a high and low of the rental revenue. Um, but it's all about the, the guests and the bathroom count, the, the bedroom count. Here's a story I like to share about that highlights the importance of the bedroom count. We have a five bedroom, three bathroom in Kierland. Completely remodeled, designed exclusively to be a vacation rental. That thing does about $130,000 a year in gross rental revenue, right? We have a house on 32nd in Lincoln. Great area, but we don't think about that as necessarily a hot spot for vacation rentals. 10 bedroom, that thing's gonna do about $560,000 this year. So I, that highlights the point of its bedroom count is so, so important. I cannot tell you how many times a week we have to turn down guest calling because we don't have enough 10 bedroom homes for them. Because whenever the gals who come out for their sorority trip reunion and there's 16 of them, they don't want to share six bedrooms, right? They, they don't want to be in bunk beds. Um, when, the, when the guys trips are coming out here and they're all spending 10 grand each, they want their own bedroom, right? Um, so when we kind of configure the rooms, we, have, we look at each, so we, we look at the configuration this way. We put a king size bed in every room that fits with, right? From there, assuming space permits, we're gonna find one room, take that king bed out and add two queen beds. Just like you could in a hotel room, right? Um, and then we're gonna find another room, space permitting, where we're gonna take that king size bed out and we're gonna add in two sets of twin over full bunk beds, right? So we're always gonna identify the rooms that way. Now, if space permits say, hey, we can only put one queen size bed in here, we can't do a king. Okay, we're stuck, you know, we're stuck with a queen size bed. Um, but we, we typically want to start with a king and then identify one room, add the two queens. That's the ideal situation. The open and update of floor plans and kitchens are important, the high ceilings, uh, we already talked about the large outdoor play areas and all the little amenities, the heated pool and swimming pool, the putting green. The location is uber important, particularly the HOA. An example I always cite is Clearwater Hills or Clearwater States over on, on uh, Tatum. Are you all familiar with the neighborhood? Oh, yes, I am. Right, so there was a vacation rental in there for years and years and years and nobody had any issue with it at all. Are you familiar with the story? Yeah. Yeah, and then, and then uh, they threw three weekends in a row, there were three parties in a row. 60 days later, there's, is it a 12 month or a six month minimum now? I, I think it's six months. I was told 12, but then I think I heard it's, it's really six months. Because a buddy of mine lives up there and he was, Rego was telling me. There. Yeah, I was, but the, the point being is, six months ago there was no restriction. You got a smoking deal, I got a house up on, Clearwater Hills, I'm gonna Airbnb, it's $2 million. Now all of a sudden your customer's in there and you're the bad guy. So we're gonna avoid HOAs, regardless of how great the deal is. Um, going back to location, I think this is also very interesting. As we talked, we talked about cap rate and how cap rate's calculated, right? How, how much do we acquire the property for by what we make each year? So 
What do we know about real estate that's on a main road? Is it more expensive or less expensive? Usually less expensive? Less expensive, right? Now, from a revenue standpoint, from a vacation rental, mm -hmm. is that gonna generate the same more or less than a house three, home, three streets in? It's, it's about the same, if not a little bit more. For they want to be, they want to be on the main road. It's easier to see. It's easier to find. They don't know it's a main road. They just know that there's a sexy futon and a putting green, and the you know grandma's They're gonna love hanging out there. They have no idea about the road noise. So the point being is that when we look to identify homes, we love them when they're on a main road. Because we're what are we doing? We're increasing that cap rate if we can reduce our yeah. acquisition price. Yeah, right? cap rate's much better. Yeah, ab absolutely right. So we always look for, um, that's one of the things that we look for. Obviously these are, these are rules, there's exceptions to every rule. Um, but except for the no HOA, that's a steadfast rule. We definitely don't want to uh, go into the HOA. Um, that's pretty much everything I had that I was hoping to cover with, with everyone tonight to help educate a little bit more about the vacation rental industry. Um, any questions, love to have. I know we've kind of had it pretty open, fluid conversations throughout. What about areas, um, Cactus Corridor? Yeah, so Cactus Corridor is great. And as we go back to the example of Kierlin versus 32nd and Lincoln, it is more about the house, the, the, house, the square footage of the lot right? Because we want the buffer zone because people are loud, right? Yeah. They're on vacation. So the more buffer zone we have, Cactus Corridor is phenomenal for that because they're really big lots. They're separated from their neighbors. Um, but the bedroom counts are very, very important. And so um, the more bedrooms, the better, right? And from a vacation rental standpoint, you know, we look at bedrooms as uh, a, a separate sleeping area, right? So it may not have a window, it'd be an office, from a from a real estate standpoint, but we would consider that a bedroom as a vacation rental. We can put an armoire there um, if it doesn't have a closet. Murphy, so, do you do Murphy beds all at all or never? Uh, typically, no, because um, there there's some better options out there than the than the Murphy beds. We'll do a queen size bed with a futon pull out. Um, Murphy beds. Are cooler in theory than they are in in they're practice. Or... Yeah, they're hard to come that to bring down, and yeah. uh, um, it's just. So for a six bedroom house, would you just have one bedroom for the kids? Or would yeah, you on the yeah. House? So we're all we all try and have at least one bedroom for the kids. So if it's only a five bedroom, only a six bedroom, we still want that room for the kids. If it's an eleven bedroom, ten bathroom, um, right? We have a new one. We're bringing on just you can walk to Echo Canyon Trailhead, right? 11 bedroom, 10 bathroom, we're still gonna have a kid's room, right? And the more little separate areas we can have, so we have two bedrooms and a little living room in this part of the house, awesome. Uh, we, uh, over on this wing, we have a little seating area. We have a little back uh, barbecue pit area. So places where people can kind of go off and do their own thing, or they can all meet in the middle and kind of party at the, around the pool table or on the putting green or in the heated pool. To go back about location, I know you were asking about that. I actually showed a house and they've been using it as a vacation rental. It was up on, you know, basically Carefree, you know, Carefree okay. Highway, just a little west of Scottsdale Road. House was gorgeous. Started talking with the agent, found out what they were getting on the VRBO and literally walked away saying, how can I figure this out? Because the ROI was great. I was a little bit surprised. I mean, great views, but you're a little bit more remote from, mm -hmm. you know, your restaurants, we've got golf courses. What do you find? What are people looking for? Where do they want to be in the valley? Yeah, so let's start with Scottsdale, Paradise Valley, and Arcadia, right? Those are the big spots where everybody wants to be, and everything plays second fiddle to those three. Um, Outside of that, it's now we get into the, the bed count and the size of the house. And we look up at Cave Creek or and that, was it, you say Carefree? Well, and it was actually a Scottsdale um, address. It right. was just very far north. Very far north. But what else right. do we have up there far north? We have True North mm -hmm. and we have the Boulders. And those two venues host a lot of weddings. Okay. Now, we don't allow weddings, but what we do have often 
is all of the out of town guests coming and staying in the in the vacation rental. So I would suspect that they are getting, like we do, a lot of wedding parties that are staying in the units. So you think it's just, again, going back to it's dependent on the house? Mm -hmm. A little bit more. It's on the house. I mean, obviously, the further away you go from everything, you're going to start to kind of uh, reduce the, the rental revenue that way. But it's hard because it's kind of a sliding scale, right? That you could be further north, but have this amazing property and um, it has all the outdoor amenities and you're gonna do well. Or it could be far north and uh, have 15 bedrooms and the house is remodeled in 1970 and it's not gonna do well, right? right? Okay. So there's a lot of different variables in there, but um, you know, it, it would do okay. And that's one of the main reasons why is because of the, the wedding events up there. So we can just stay focused in those areas because like it could, unless something hits our desk, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the women are the ones booking for rentals, but I'm gonna guess that it's the man that's looking to buy as an investment. Um, you know, I haven't found that to be the rule okay. necessarily as much as it's been, um, we have men and women that, that are equally astute investors and, and just kind of it's, it depends on the individual. Um, what I don't about areas that you're seeing? Because I'm thinking of marketing. Mm -hmm. So if you, we had a property that we wanted to market, um, Chicago, Canada, sure. any, any certain. Oh, in terms of who's buying it, um, yeah. all, you know, a lot of the the salt cities, um, so the New York, Chicago land, San Francisco, um, Minneapolis those areas that have a very high cost of living okay. uh, are coming here. California too. You know where we're, what we're starting to see a lot of right now, and we're gonna see even more over the next 12 months, is European money. We have a lot of European money coming in. What's going on in Europe right now? What do their interest rates look like? I need to pay you to put my money in the bank, right? They have negative interest rates. Mm -hmm. So why on earth are they gonna put their money in the bank and pay you, the bank, to put my money there? So they're coming over here to the States. So we're seeing a lot of European money start to come over here in this space right now. Any specific area in Europe? Um, no, I mean, Germany's, I mean, no, no. Okay. Short answer is no. Okay. Nothing, nothing we found other than really anywhere in the, in the EU that's facing the negative interest rates right now is okay. the smart money is looking to get out of there right now. Kind of like how North Dakota was for a while with mm -hmm. oil. A little bit different because but yeah, it's kind of like new money, the North Dakota, the, the oil money. Anytime we have that oil money, they're looking to spend it. Well, they had negative interest rates too. Okay. So that's why they were buying properties here. Okay. Yeah, I, did, I didn't know that. I don't, not any more. I don't think as much, but. Okay. But what about Chinese money still? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's all over. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of harder to track. You, you see very, yeah, I feel like the, the Chinese money's been here for a while. Uh, and you're just seeing the European money start to come over now, and, and I think it'll continue to get even even more in the next 12 months okay. it, as we kind of go through it. And the real estate here is still relatively inexpensive, right? Do you do you have concerns about saturation at all? Well, we do, and that's why we go in the in the higher the footprint because you just don't have as much. Competitors. The barrier to entry is so significantly higher that you know everybody who wants to get into this industry. Want oh, let me dip my toes in. Let me buy a. Eight hundred thousand dollar three bedroom house. You know, let me let me go up in North Scottsdale. It's in Kierland. Here's eight hundred. Well, that's great, but why not do a million and a quarter on north of Camelback, and don't pay the the premium Arcadia pricing, and have a great big home. We're going to Cactus Quarter. I mean, what's a Cactus Quarter running right? A million and a half to two and a half right now ish. Well, what too? One trend we have in our what because we do we work with a lot of second home buyers is they have. They want like they're looking for them, but they also have their kids and then their kids' families. And so, like if it was a six-bedroom house, would be great. They don't need that for them, but if they were able to host their families there and then offset with the income, then it would make more financial sense because they that yeah that's make more money. Yeah, absolutely, that's the case. So um, our owners have an owner's login portal. They can reserve the space whenever they want to use it. Our contracts are always thirty-day cancellation. If you don't like us, we don't like you, we can cancel within 30 day notice. 
Um, that way when the homeowner is coming over and they're staying here spring training in the month of March and Thanksgiving, we're like, hey, you know, maybe it's not a good fit to work with Parsons Villas. Um, so, um, and so, so the homeowners can come in and, and stay when they want doing that. Because even um, in the summer, there's still stuff to do here. So they might yeah. find that there's vacancy like, hey, we're bored, let's go yeah. to Yeah, let's come out here for the 4th of July or yeah. for what, XYZ long weekend. Yeah. And uh, I mean, because we're, we're, you know, we're tricking out these homes, right? With the putting green and the heated yeah. pool and like what kid doesn't want to go play in those places, right? Yeah. We have the Xbox in every home. We have a gaming system. Um, you, you, it's places where families, you know, it's a family vacation spot. So mm -hmm. it, it seems to be a good fit for the families that want to use it on their own um, when it's not being rented and, and generate revenue whenever it's not. Well, we are getting more fun stuff too. like. Medieval Times or... Medieval Times or Great Wolf Lodge has just the opened Great Wolf up. Great Wolf Lodge is going to be awesome, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's opened up yet or not. It did just open. It did? Yeah. Is it officially yeah. open? White Castle's coming in another I month or so. Know. It's in the same location, right? Right there at Viet Ventura in the 101. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, so, we were one of the pioneers of Top Golf, had it first in the States. So if people were, you know, if people are like, I have $200,000 to buy like a condo, would you say don't even, would you say use that as more like a long-term rental or obviously you guys don't work with people in that person? Yeah, so we don't work, we don't work in that space and, and I would argue that it's gonna be very hard to make the numbers pencil out to buy a $200,000 condo because where are you buying a $200,000 anything? Nowhere where anybody wants to vacation. Yeah. Well, the or let's say, let's say 300,000 like two bedroom, two bath in this area. So, uh, <sighs> The, the homes in that size and that price range has been our experience that we've had in our inventory. You're looking at like a, maybe a $50,000 a year high end gross rental revenue. So when you're, you know, gross. So now those numbers are cut in half of what we said. So now your acquisition price, your 10% your of your acquisition price. So the numbers just don't pencil out that way. Um, now I have heard, you all can probably tell me this better than me, but I have heard that rents for long term is at, are at all time highs. They are. In Scottsdale. Right. So here, The whole entire area. Because mm -hmm. we have more people here than the amount of homes we have here. Yeah, and the net migration is crazy. Yeah. Net it migration. was different in 08, we had like 12,000 vacant houses. So it was, it's a different market now, but. Yeah, and uh, I mean, and people are coming, it's a new Silicon Valley, you know, they're building all this stuff out uh, west on the 303, and we have the Jerry Colangelo, his new city he's building, and the Bill Gates, the new city he's building, and um, again, you're seeing Silicon Valley move out here, more and more out there is, you know, East LA, we call it, over there by the 303, because we have no natural disasters, we have solar to cool down their computers, uh, cost of living significantly less, so we're gonna continue to see the and political refugees from California. Yes. <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah. I'm I'm from California, so I we talk a lot of them, see a yeah. lot of them, and right, right. All of us in Southern California today on the 101 freeway. <laughs> yeah, it felt like it today, right? Yeah. Exactly with the big accident. Um, well, that's everything I had. I, I really appreciate everybody coming today and. And uh, hopefully you're able to get a little bit of great information.